So in the last video, we explained the difference between the fed state and fasted state metabolism. And I have a link of it below. I highly recommend you watch that before you watch this video. But in this video, I'm going to focus on the fed state of metabolism. So let's say we've just eaten a meal. We know that meal has lots of macromolecules like carbohydrates and proteins and fats. So that meal is going to enter into our stomach, then into our intestines, then it's going to get absorbed into our bloodstream. So all those carbohydrates, that glucose from our meal will be absorbed into our bloodstream. Now our blood glucose concentrations are going to increase because all of that glucose from our meal enters into our blood. So now we have high concentrations of glucose in our blood. So this tells our body that we're in the fed state of metabolism. We've just fed and therefore we have high blood glucose concentrations. So now our body should enter the fed state of metabolism. So how do our cells know to enter the fed state metabolism? Well, our pancreas senses that, senses that high blood glucose concentration. The pancreas senses that we have a lot of glucose in our blood, so therefore we must be in the fed state. So due to that high glucose, the pancreas then releases insulin. So now that insulin is released into the bloodstream, and now that insulin tells all of our cells and our organ systems that, hey, we're in the fed state. We've just eaten a meal. We have a lot of blood glucose. So therefore, all of our cells and organs should enter the fed state of metabolism and go through a very specific set of reactions in relation to that fed state. So first of all, that insulin tells all of our cells we should enter the fed state of metabolism. Also, that insulin helps certain cell types absorb that glucose. Because now that we've just eaten a meal and we have a lot of glucose in our bloodstream, now our cells should absorb that glucose. And it also indirect, indirectly helps other cells absorb that glucose. But the point is, the insulin, it's due to this insulin that tells our bodies that we're in the fed state. And this is how our cells know to enter the fed state of metabolism. So what are some of the reactions that occur during this fed state? Well, first of all, the insulin tells the liver that we're in the fed state. So it tells the liver that first it should absorb a lot of glucose. So now the liver, liver absorbs a lot of glucose. Now it takes all that glucose and it goes through high amounts of glycolysis. And we know what happens when we do glycolysis. We take glucose, we enter glycolysis, so we do a bunch of chemical reactions, and we eventually convert that glucose into pyruvate molecules. But we know when we go through this glycolysis, a byproduct is creating ATP. So now, during this fed state, our liver goes through high amounts of glycolysis and produces a lot of ATP. And this makes sense, because we're in the fed state, we've just eaten a lot of glucose, so we have a lot of glucose, so this is a good opportunity to use that glucose to go through glycolysis to create a lot of ATP. So now we've created a lot of ATP, so now we can start going through anabolism. Anabolism is when we create larger macromolecules. It's when we start building macromolecules. But this anabolism requires a lot of ATP. So therefore, we mostly do anabolism during the fed state. Because in the fed state, we, we've created a lot of ATP. So it's the perfect time to go through anabolism. So what are some examples? Well, we know we've just eaten a meal, so we have a lot of excess glucose. So we should store some of that glucose. We know there's a lot of energy in this glucose, so we should store some of it. So what we do is we take that glucose and in certain cell types like our liver and our muscles, for example, let's focus on our liver, we, we, we take in that glucose. We take in that glucose and we store it in the form of glycogen. So now we're storing some of that glucose, which makes sense. So we know we take this glucose from the bloodstream, it enters into cells like our liver, and then we store that glucose in the form of glycogen. We just store a bunch of these glucose molecules in the form of glycogen, so now we have a storage form of glucose. And this process is activated by insulin. Insulin activates this pro process of glycogenesis, the genesis of glycogen, the creation of glycogen. And again, this occurs in certain uh, cell types. So that's the first thing we do. However, after a certain point, our glycogen stores get filled up. We can only store so much glucose in the form of glycogen. So what happens once we fill up all of our glycogen stores? Maybe we still have some excess glucose. Maybe we drank a soda or we had a very sugary meal. So now we have a lot of excess glucose. So yeah, we stored that glucose in the form of glycogen, but eventually those glycogen stores get filled up. So what do we do with that remaining glucose? Well, now that remaining glucose can essentially enter into our cells and especially in our liver. And then our liver takes that glucose and it converts it into acetyl-CoA.
And essentially the way it does this is it takes the glucose and enters it through glycolysis to create pyruvate and then through one quick reaction we create acetyl-CoA. But the point is we take all that remaining excess glucose, it enters it into our liver and we convert it into acetyl-CoA. Now once we've converted it into acetyl-CoA, we can go through a process referred to as fatty acid synthesis where we essentially synthesize, biosynthesize free fatty acids. So essentially what we're doing is we know we have a lot of excess glucose and we know there's energy in that glucose. So we should store that energy. That energy shouldn't go to waste. We should store that energy. So essentially what we do is we take that excess glucose, that energy in that glucose, and we essentially store it by converting it into fat. So all that excess energy in that glucose is essentially used to create fat. And now we've stored that energy in that glucose in the form of this fat. And so in the form of this fat. So yeah, an implication of this is, yeah, you could eat a high sugary meal, a lot of maybe drinking a lot of soda, but all that excess glucose, originally all that excess glucose will be stored as glycogen. But once those glycogen stores get filled up, all that remaining excess glucose is essentially converted straight into fat. So now we've created all this fat. So what do we do with all the, this fat and all this energy in this fat? Now we go through a process we refer to as lipogenesis, where we take those free fatty acids and we essentially link them. We, we, we link them for, through these ester linkages with this three carbon uh, gl glycerol molecule. But essentially we store it in the form of these triacylglycerides. And this process is referred to as lipogenesis. So all that energy in those free fatty acids, we essentially store it in the form of these triacylglycerides in our adipocytes. So our adipocytes have a lot of stored energy in these triacylglycerides. So this process is referred to as lipogenesis. And again, this process is stimulated by insulin. So these are all reactions associated with the fed state. But how, this, so this is fed state metabolism. And how do our cells know to go through these fed state metabolism reactions? Well, again, it's that insulin. It's that insulin telling our cells to go through these processes. So now... But, but we also know when we ate our meal, maybe we had some proteins. So what happens with those proteins that we got from our meal? Well, the, that protein is essentially hydrolyzed to create amino acids, and this occurs in our intestines. And then through our intestines, we absorb those amino acids. So now all those amino acids, acids are absorbed into our bloodstream. So what do we do with all those amino acids in our bloodstream? Well, they can be used for lots of different purposes. One example is we, we refill all those amino acid needs. All of our cells need amino acids. So now all those amino acids can enter our, into our cells and, be, and restore those amino acids filled for, for all those needs to create proteins and, and other processes. We can also take that, that energy in those amino acids and essentially oxi oxidize them. So we take those amino acids, for example, they can enter into our liver and they can be oxidized to create ATP. They can essentially, we can modify those amino acids to enter glycolysis in the Krebs cycle to be oxidized to create ATP. And we know we need this ATP to go through all that anabolism that we described earlier. And also what can happen to those amino acids is they can also be converted to acetyl-CoA. And once they're converted into acetyl-CoA, they can now enter this process to be stored as fat, as triacylglycerides and as fat. So again, and we also know in our meal, maybe we, we ingested some fatty acids. Well, obviously those fatty acids will be stored as triacylglycerides and they can also be oxidized to create acetyl-CoA and et cetera. But again, these reactions are what happens during the fat state of metabolism. So again, we go through a lot of anabolism. You should associate the fed state, once we've eaten a meal, the fed state of metabolism with anabolism. And again, we enter the fed state, so we create a lot of ATP, now we can go through a lot of anabolism. But there are some other anabolic processes we go through. For example, remember this acetyl-CoA, which was created through glucose and also amino acids and also fatty acids can be converted to acetyl-CoA, but all this acetyl-CoA can also be, be used to create cholesterol. We use acetyl-CoA to biosynthesize cholesterol. And again, this is primarily occurring in the liver. But again, this process, these sets of reactions is upregulated by insulin. It's a lot more complicated than that because cholesterol metabolism is, is very complex. But the point is insulin helps upregulate this process of converting acetyl-CoA to cholesterol. So we're also going through anabolism and biosynthesizing cholesterol. And also, we during the FET state, we also upregulate protein synthesis. And again, it's more complex than that. Really, there are hormones that regulate protein synthesis and really the needs of if we need a specific protein, we'll synthesize it. But overall, protein synthesis is upregulated during, during the FET state.
So again, this is what happens during the Fed state, and a lot of these processes are stimulated by insulin. There's another very important process you should associate with the Fed state, and that's referred to as the pentose phosphate pathway. So for example, in our liver, we know we had that glucose and we went through glycolysis converting it to pyruvate. But we know we went through a lot of these chemical reactions which make up glycolysis, but one of these intermediates of glycolysis can enter another pathway referred to as the pentose phosphate pathway. So when we take that intermediate of glycolysis and enter it through the pentose phosphate pathway, we create two important in byproducts. We create ribose 5-phosphate and we create NADPH. This ribose 5-phosphate can be used to create nucleotides. For example, RNA and DNA, and we know those are important for the cell cycle and for uh, transcription and, and protein expression. So we know, so we create this ribose 5-phosphate through this pentose phosphate pathway. So once we create this ribose 5-phosphate, it can be used as an intermediate to create nucleic acids. And also we create this NADPH, which is essentially a reduced cofactor that can donate electrons for anabolism. Because again, we know we go through anabolism in the fed state, and essentially for anabolism, we need to create larger molecules. And these larger molecules require electrons, and we get those electrons from this NADPH. So again, this pentose phosphate pathway is another process that's upregulated during the fed state. And it's, so again, it's a reaction you should associate with the fed state. But how do our cells know to go through this pentose phosphate pathway? Well, again, it's this insulin. So again, the point is, there's, there's two states of metabolism, the fed state of metabolism and fasted state of metabolism. In the next video, we'll talk about the fasted state. I have a link of that video below. But during the fed state, Essentially, we're in the fed state. We've just eaten a meal, so we had a, a lot of excess nutrients in, it, in our bloodstream. So we can use those nutrients to essentially, we can oxidize them through glycolysis and other path pathways to create ATP. Now that we've created a lot of ATP, this is the perfect opportunity to go through anabolism and create all the larger biomolecules we need for life. And we also want to store the excess energy in those nutrients we, we consumed. But So these are reactions associated with the fed state. But again, how do our cells, how do our organs know to go through the fed state? Again, it's that insulin. It's that insulin that essentially upregulates and activates all these processes related to the fed state.